that's number one. You kind of reset your painful tender to the touch. May I also right. same shoulder length and the other. Hey everybody, welcome back. This is episode three. Numero tres. Wow, you know, the, uh, what is it? 90% of podcasts never get past their third episode. So we need to do we are at celebrating. least a number four. But we're we're on, celebrating. We'll celebrate on the fourth one. Okay, we'll I'm going to start now. Bring wine. <laughs> Bring healthy wine. Done. Anyways, I have it. this is called Real Health with Brandy and Amir. I'm Dr. Amir Rashidian, a chiropractor. This is Brandy Rashidian, my bride, and she's an honorary chiropractor, definitely a doctor of many things, um, fantastic mom. And um, what we do here is we talk about how to feel better and get stronger, how to live longer and feel younger. younger. And we do that by reviewing articles and news reports uh, of the latest uh, current events. Yeah, there's a lot of health-related news out there, and um, it's hard to get through all of it, you know, individually. And it's yes. hard to know what's, you know, what's really health. You know, yeah. are not all of these are things that we really want to put into practice, right? So we want to be able to help take you through some of those and just help you ask some great questions yeah. and maybe even get a few answers. So maybe never know. So recently we had uh, our first article. Um, we we had terrible air quality, and you remember we. I remember specifically one day we came out. So we live on the side of a mountain, and so we're kind of high up. I remember I came out the door and literally smelled smoke. Oh yeah, it and was amazing. It's because of the wildfires in uh, Canada. Canada. So so we're going to talk about um, air quality and how it affects you and what it's done. And so this article is from NPR. Staying safe in smoky air is particularly important for some people. Here's how. I would think it's important for all people. That would be my guess. But, uh, you know, the article says some people. Smoky air is filled with microscopic flakes of particulate matter that can get into the lungs and even into the bloodstream. Interesting. Be careful what you breathe in. Of course, it's not as bad as smoking. Uh, pulmonologist, pulmonologist Dr. Ravi Calhan of Northwestern Medicine likened it to New Yorkers smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So I guess the air was awful in New York. And we saw some pictures where it actually looked hazy, like they're walking. Yeah. I mean, through. it did for us too, though. Yeah, it's true. I mean, our kids were in, uh, were in a day camp. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, here in Maryland, uh, during, during that. And, um, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was, you know, went to work, not even thinking about the kids, not, you know, maybe they shouldn't be outside. And yeah, you uh, always think, go get some fresh air, oh, right. you know, like go outside and get some fresh air and yeah. this, this way, you go, stay inside and breathe some fresh air. <laughs> yeah. It was way fresher inside for sure. So, but they did keep them inside, you know, yeah. which I'm thankful that they were, you know, thinking about that. And yeah, we don't want kids smoking, smoke uh, like like it says a pack pack of cigarettes a day. That's quite a bit. That's and, astronomical. Uh, so, did you know that the human lungs aren't fully formed and developed until the age of seven? I did know that, but I live with you. Of course. Yes. And so, <laughs> don't feel bad for her. It's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I do good things. Um, You're great. Thank you. The lungs don't develop till the age of seven. Yeah. And so when a child of younger than seven age is exposed to cigarette smoke, it permanently damages their lungs. Right. And it, it, it may repair, it may not, but because it's embryo, embryo, em, embryon, embryonologically not developed yet, it may be permanent damage. So we want to protect everybody seven years and younger from any smoke That's whatsoever. Right. No secondhand smoke, no firsthand smoke, very clearly not outside when Canada's burning. So we need to make sure and, and protect them at all costs. So article says people with pre-existing lung conditions like asthma or COPD, which stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, are uh, most at risk. Smoky skies can cause itchy eyes, sore throat, headaches, and even a little nausea, but it's the fine part particles, particulate matter that's 2.5 microns or less in diameter, which means they go through your mask. That's not in the article. 
that are gosh masks are such a big topic people are so sensitive about masks um uh, the particular matter that's uh 2.5 microns or less in diameter are the biggest health hazard these particles can get into your lungs and for people with lung conditions they can trigger a flare-up worst case scenario you might even have to be admitted to the hospital poor air quality can also be a problem for people with cardiovascular disease Research by the Environmental Protection Agency and others has found exposure to particle pollution increases hospitalizations for serious cardiovascular events like heart failure, stroke, heart attacks, and death. So definitely. So I be guess careful. we're saying lungs are important. Absolutely. So, and, um, so you, you know, I, I saw this is not in the article. I saw uh, studies were done with uh, people who wear a mask a lot and uh, the oxygen content inside the mask was as low as the tailpipe of a running car it's pretty scary when you think about it yeah so it, you you because you, you you're mainly breathing back in your own carbon dioxide right. that you exhale now when you exhale i, I think 80 percent of it is still oxygen mm -hmm. that's, that's why right. so the first exhale has a lot of oxygen but the second exhale has last third more right. you keep breathing in the same air um, it's not good for us. Uh, but then again, there's research that shows exercising in low oxygen states make your body more efficient, more versatile, more resilient. So that's why a lot of people will go to like uh, Denver, mile high, in order to go up to high altitudes and train in high altitudes, especially people on Tour de France, yep. ex-bikers, because you produce more red blood cells and your oxygen carrying ability improves, your body becomes more efficient. So you're like, well, are we actually helping ourselves by wearing the masks? Well, but th think about it. They're also doing that in a controlled short term time frame, right. right? That's true. So it's the same as somebody going into the gym and wearing a mask when they're running. Now, during COVID, I was mad as a hornet at the idea of having to wear a mask when I was working out. That is not my cup of tea. So I fully appreciate those that are doing that, you know, to, to improve their, their health, you know, while they're working out, I, I cannot do it. I need to suck in every bit of air when I am in there as, <laughs> as much as possible. If you don't need that, you're not exercising hard enough. Yep. I, I would say that would yeah. probably be a, and, and those, those who do the oxygen deprivation exercises, I think those are more the elite athletes. Yeah. It's not you and I. I may look like wow. An, I may Can look you like an just elite. just said that to me in front of all of you guys. We, we, I look <laughs> I look like an elite athlete, but I'm not. I just play one on TV. Yes, or on podcast. Um, so, anyways, children are susceptible. Uh, be careful with kids going outside in poor quality air. Um, you know, this brings up. Hang on, I'm going to skim through this because we already talked about some of this. Inhaling polluted air can also impact development of fetus. Mm. So, and this was another thing I was really worried about during COVID because there a lot of pregnant ladies were wearing their masks 24 hours a day. Yeah. Um, I guess they took it off when they were sleeping, but hopefully. Uh, hopefully. Um, but again, that, that deprives the fetus of oxygen. So minimize exposure. First, check the air quality where you live by going to the EPA website, which is airnow.gov, airnow.gov, which has a color-coded meter showing the air quality in your area. If the air is rated unhealthy, the best advice is to stay inside as much as possible. Keep the doors and windows closed. Well, there you have it. Clean air is yep. important. Now, um... There are these things called HIPAA filters that clean the air quality in your home. Uh, they're, I recommend them. They're good. Uh, but you can make one. Um, you, can, you can make an air filter at home by taking one of these HIPAA filters. So you can put in your HVAC system, but you can take one. You can make one for yourself. It says get a HIPAA filter, H-E-P-A. HEPA. HEPA filter, and attach it to a box fan and uh, you get about 50% reduction in air pollution indoors. Just get one of those big box fans. Yeah. Stick the HEPA filter in front of it, and you've got an air filter, homemade air filter. Interesting. If you have a gas stove, try to avoid using it when the air quality is bad. If there's like a short on that, our kids have probably already tried it. They are life hacking everything these days. 
It also says don't vacuum or burn candles because that will just add more particles to your indoor air. I don't know. Yeah, there are some types of candles that are actually extremely toxic. Mm. So um, that's why we don't burn candles anymore. So I'm very, very cautious about Interesting. about what we burn in the house. It says drink lots of water. Uh, fluid keeps your eyes, nose, and throat moist, which helps alleviate irritation. Anyways, it goes on and talks about making sure you wear a mask when you go outside. Um, again, I'm not sure about the mask. Uh, I'm not going to take a stance one way or the other. Do your own research. If it makes you more comfortable, wear it. Um, but I do know it does reduce oxygen. Definitely don't go for a jog when the air is bad quality. I mean, use, just use common sense. And if, if the air quality is not good, just stay home. There can't be anything that's that important, right? That if, if you're looking at risking your health or if you're out, be out very minimally. So, and if you already have a pre-existing that is, you know, is going to be complicated by that use your best judgment i think a lot of this stuff is common sense too right or do we call it uncommon sense you know what i do i do remember remember when we went to um the mountain experience oh, yeah, in colorado fun. we were eight thousand feet above sea level, 8500 feet above sea level on top of a mountain at a uh camp mm -hmm. and uh so so it's our first day there and Brandy and I decide we're going to go for a walk. And uh, like five minutes later, I'm all out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> and Brandy said, did you go for a walk without me? I said, no, I'm out of breath because I just finished putting my shoes on. <laughs> now, mind you, this is also <laughs> after years before we had been uh, in Colorado for a wedding. Yeah, that's right. And we went, we were at the hotel and we decided to go for a jog on the treadmill beforehand. Beautiful views. I mean, it was, it was gorgeous at uh, the hotel that we were yeah. at. And uh, we literally get on. And like a minute, minute and a half in, I have to start walking. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. It's, being it's in this amazing kind of shape. how high altitude affects. It's tremendous. Your, your energy and so on. It messes with my cooking too. And uh, so, anyways, this is the next article. It's called The Guardian. Tens of millions uh, under air quality alert in U.S. as Canada fire smoke drifts south. So again, it talks about harmful pollution. Uh, talks about states, uh, New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut being the, uh, the worst air. Public schools actually canceled outdoor activities. The wildfires in Canada, uh, there have been there are hundreds of those fires. But one thing it mentions is in, in there, there are certain countries that just always have bad air. Mm -hmm. So uh, the city Delhi in India consistently ranks among the worst cities for air pollution during the wildfires it was ranked sixth worse wow so that means there were some towns in canada and u.s that were worse wow um it says we have defenses in our upper airway to trap larger particles and prevent them from getting down into the lungs these are sort of the right size to get past these defenses so the ones that were in the polluted air when those particles get down into the respiratory space they cause the body to have inflam an inflammatory reaction to them. So I think I gotcha. the, the reason I, I brought this up is because of that inflammatory reaction. The body can't be inflamed. The inflammatory response to a degree is normal. It, it's good. We want inflammation to go up and down throughout it's the body. It's a protective. Right. It's a good thing, but but not when it's chronically elevated. Also, most people yeah. are already inflamed. Stress inflames. Uh, negative stress uh, getting upset inflames it as well. A 2021 study supported the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association found that climate change has been the main driver of the increase in hot, dry fire weather in the western U.S. So they're saying climate change is the reason we're getting so many wildfires. By 2090, global fires are expected to increase in intensity by up to 57% thanks to climate change, a United Nations report warned last year. So I think that's another reason I wanted to talk about this article is because climate change, like masks, is one of those sensitive issues yeah. because it, it's one of those things where there's evidence on both sides. There's so many experts who say, no, climate is supposed to cycle and you're going to have heat and you're going to have cold and it's going to fluctuate and you go through these cycles. The um, the Arctic 
ice will melt, but it'll grow back. It'll refreeze and it'll melt again. We're going to have these cycles and we don't have anything to worry about. The experts, one thing they do agree is that it's not fossil fuels that make the air uh, worse or climate change worse. It's actually um, people and animals, which is why... um, a certain famous person in a 2010 TED Talk said, we need to reduce the Earth's population by one third. I won't mention who that was because I don't want us to get canceled. Right. Um, but uh, it's it's kind of scary that some of the ho- most powerful people, most influential people are actually focused on reducing the Earth's population yep. in order to improve climate. Yeah, because you have to ask why. Like, why is that so much more important if no one is? It's a chicken or an egg, right? Like, you need to have people to be around to enjoy the climate, mm-hmm. yet we're the ones. Yeah, well, they say it's, it's you know, humans exhaling. Mm-hmm. They, a study was done, and I, please look this up because I don't remember the citation or any of that. I should have had... We should have brought that one in, but it's an older article. It talked about how if you get rid of all fossil fuels and every combustion engine, you'll improve air quality by 0.05%. So it's like a lot of effort for very little return. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if you reduce the population of Earth by half, you improve air quality and, and climate by 50%. Yeah, I just struggle with the ethical <laughs> dilemma that yeah. that presents. Yeah. I, I mean, we we know there's been many people in power who have believed that reducing the world's population um, would be better. We've seen the results of that. Uh, hopefully, we haven't forgotten those individuals throughout time who've made that decision to do so. Uh, I think we should be watching the people who now say that population reduction is uh, something that we should be looking at. Regardless, uh, having a good air filter at home is not a bad idea. Having a good water filter at home is not a bad idea. Air and water are things you ingest the most. And so Mm -hmm. it's good to make sure you're, you know, breathing and drinking good good water. And in fact, speaking of water, I came across this article because it talked about, uh, you you know, air pollution affects your energy levels and inflammatory response and so on. And I remembered way back, we used to take this thing called a hydrogen pill Mm -hmm. and we used to put in our water and drink the water. I'd forgotten about it until you mentioned it. So I pulled up this article and this, this is an old article. It's from 2010. Uh, it's it's a scientific article, so it's it's written in you know science language, um, but it's called molecular hydrogen as a potential treatment for acute and chronic fatigue. So someone has uh, energy issues, you're tired all the time, especially worse when the air quality is low. Um, hydrogen is not a bad thing, and it seems to increase. So the negative effect of um, it's called reactive oxygen can be mitigated by different antioxidants such as curcumin, N-acetylcysteine, or molecular hydrogen. In a groundbreaking publication from 2007, and I won't pronounce the name, described molecular hydrogen to be a therapeutic antioxidant gas which selectively reduces cytotoxic oxygen radicals. So we love to teach you things that help you stay young and vibrant and feel better and get stronger. This is going to be one of those. This may be one of those where you may want to look up um, some uh, hydrogen tablets and you just put in your water and drink it. It says, surprisingly, molecular hydrogen can reverse the direction of transport electrons in the inner membrane of mitochondria and can further suppress the generation of superoxide in mitochondrial complex. I know everyone understood what that said. It basically means we're, we're making these changes and these protective right, opportunities mm-hmm. for, for our body at the cellular level. Yes, like exactly. It's, it's mitochondria not superficial. Is the, energy factory in each of your cells. Right. So hydrogen is generally administered by one of three delivery routes via inhalation, 
injection of hydrogen saturated salt solution or ingestion of hydrogen enriched water, which is the one I recommend. Yep. It's the easiest one. You want to get injections and all that stuff. Um, the injection of hydrogen saturated saline solutions is mostly limited to animal studies where it allows well controlled uh, doses. The most widely used form of human hydrogen intake is the ingestion of hydrogen enriched water. In the simplest form, hydrogen can be dissolved in water and packed in an appropriate material. Such products packed in aluminum foil or cans are, excuse me, available, for example, in Japan and China. More figures, it's in China. Moreover, several electrical devices in the uh, market allow the generation of hydrogen enriched water by electrolysis. So I guess they're like wires you put in your water and generates yeah. hydrogen. Uh, when using this method, the material used to produce the electrodes and the purity of the water are critical factors to avoid because you don't want to get toxic metals in your water. Right. Um, unwanted, potentially toxic chemical byproducts. Additionally, tablets are available, that's what I recommend, which mostly combine a small amount of metallic magnesium and a water-soluble acid such as malic acid, tartaric acid, and adipic acid. The reaction of the metal with the acids generates hydrogen when disintegrated in water. Yep. So you just take 16 ounces of water, throw your tablet in there and you do need to drink it right away though it's not something you can let you sit. can't let it sit exactly yeah. drink the whole thing right away 16 ounces hard to drink 16 ounces it in is one not sitting. an easy task um, but you'll get good at it uh, in a double blind placebo controlled clinical study participants underwent exercises after drinking hydrogen enriched enriched water this is what i really liked uh, effects were determined in an untrained group in which mild exercises began 30 minutes after consumption of 500 milliliters of hydrogen enriched water. Additionally, a well-trained group was investigated in which the participants drank 500 milliliters hydrogen enriched water 10 minutes before starting moderate exercise. For the first group, a significant reduction of psychometric fatigue was determined for the second group an improvement of maximal oxygen consumption, which is VO2 max, was observed. So the first group, huh. psychometric means like they said, well, I'm not tired. Right. But they would have been tired at that time. Right. And then the VO2 max is how much oxygen are you actually absorbing and using in your body? And that increased in the more advanced athletic group. Uh, another study in 10 male soccer players with hydrogen-enriched water showed reduced blood lactate levels and alleviation of muscle fatigue. So the muscles didn't get tired. That's impressive. When they drank this hydrogen water. So does that sound like something we could all use? Uh, and by the way, it is odorless and tasteless. So that's right. it, it doesn't, it that's tastes right. just like water. An animal study reported not only anti-fatigue effects of drinking hydrogen enriched water, but also lower nitrous oxide concentrations in serum, reduction of blood glucose and lactate levels, as well as decreased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in serum. So reduced blood sugar, yep. reduced lactic acid in your muscles, and reduced inflammation. Yeah, so... Not too bad. And let's go ahead and, and just mention like what lactic acid is in case somebody doesn't know. Lactic acid builds up in your muscle when you exercise. So if you, if you, if you sprint... You know, as fast as you can, within 10 seconds, you've got lactic acid built up. If you're doing a slow jog, it builds up a lot slower. It also contributes to how sore you are. Your muscles yeah. are sore. So that legs workout you put me through last weekend where I couldn't walk for two days, that's because of the lactic acid buildup, correct? Yes. Partially. That That's how I get revenge. <laughs> Make her work out. Make her work out. Well, you guys can come work out with me sometime. Molecular hydrogen is safe and is an authorized food additive according to the regulations of the European Commission. Hydrox and hydro hydroliox are gas mixtures for deep sea divers. Hmm. In several publications, the beneficial effects of hydrogen in cases of fatigue have been shown. 
and we suggest that, this is the author speaking, we suggest that the potential role of molecular hydrogen in preventing and treating fatigue alone or in combination with other treatments is worthy of further attention. So the group that produced this research article and got it published, they said one of us, his name is Kurt Lucas, suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome mm -hmm. for one month in 2011. Daily intake of about one liter of hydrogen-enriched water for a period of four weeks led to the disappearance of symptoms. That, that's impressive. Yeah. Takeaway message, find yourself some uh, hydrogen tablets. Can we tell them sources? Is that all right? I think it's fine. Yeah. So we get ours from where? Uh, we get ours from Mercola Market. I really, I love Dr. Mercola. I yeah. love um, the research that he puts into his products. Right. If you're looking for supplements that- now, we're, we're not endorsing this. We're not getting paid by no, Dr. Mercola or any of that, but uh, we're just telling you what we use and we're not yeah. telling you to use the same product. Uh, no, uh, but it's out there and available. It's Do available, your research. Yeah. Do some research, figure out hydrogen tablets, put them in your water, drink it. We got one last one to talk about. And uh, I-, I I lumped this with these articles because we talked about air quality, we talked about fatigue and, and how you can increase your energy using hydrogen, reduce inflammation, all that stuff. So we're gonna talk a little bit about COVID. And this article was in Newsweek. It says, mental health experts, colon, strategies for supporting kids post COVID. So apparently a lot of children are having mental issues, psychological issues after COVID. Here's what it says, it says, I believe our Clinical staff was aware of how imperative it is for humans to interact socially, particularly during times of crisis. Yeah. So you got a crisis where everyone's scared, everyone's afraid. The media is terrifying us because all they show is people on ventilators. And, uh, and, and then they tell you to be by yourself. Stay home. Don't talk to anybody. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. And, uh, and children. Can't, can't have that. I mean, maybe adults are a little more resilient, but killed, kids can't have this. So, And I think as a whole pre-COVID, we were all pretty good about not allowing our fears to necessarily always impact our kids, right? right. But when you have something so elevated and, and so globally scary, right? do you know what I mean? These are things that most of these parents have, have never had to deal with. Right. The, oh yeah, the world the last, never seen The last big like pandemic that. was. I mean, I, I know there was um, um, H one N one, and um, bird flu, pig flu, horse yeah. horse flu, monkeypox. We we had we've had others, um, but the one that shut the country down was in 1952, I believe. Yeah. Don't quote me on this. Look it up. I think it was 1950. It was polio. Mm -hmm. And they shut down all public places and schools and things like that for and for two years. And that's why I remember I told you, I said, this whole thing's going to blow over in two years right. because we had it happen in the 1950s. Right. Um, but and I bet you anything, the people who lived through that had that, a lot of them would have had the same outlook uh, yeah. and anticipated the same as you did. So it would have been people who are 80 something today. Right. Were probably alive during that time. Right. So, but the people who did not, right? You know, this was a—they'd never seen anything like it. Oh yeah, I mean, to to go back and really find out the effects of what COVID did, and and um, it's gonna take it's gonna take decades, yeah, for us to truly know what the impact was, both physically and mentally. In the article, it says, "As a parent, I watched my own children struggle with remote learning fatigue, acute forgetfulness." and a yearning for more engaging activities. Oh, yeah. The spike in mental health crisis. As a mental health professional, my duties involve recognizing the effects that the pandemic has had on our children's mental health. The stress and trauma of the year, of the past year have caused a spike in mental health crises among children in 2021. The CDC Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance revealed that more than four in 10 students, actually 42%, felt hopeless or persistently sad, and one third, 31%, experienced poor mental health. Also one in 10 students attempted 
suicide in 2021 compared with 22% who seriously considered it. So 22% of children considered suicide and 10% of them actually attempted it. it it's, it's such a scary thought that um, our kids are inundated with so much fear and confusion in our culture today that those numbers are what they are. Some of the symptoms to look out for include hearing voices and inability to sleep despite high energy levels, diminished appetite, self-harm, aggressiveness, neglect of social etiquette, and forgetfulness. If any of these symptoms appear, it may be a sign of a more serious mental health condition and professional help should be sought. Yeah, it just, I think the biggest thing is we need to be talking to our kids. Talk to our kids, talk to them all the time. Even when they don't wanna to talk to us, we need to be talking to them. Yeah, That's the only, it's engagement, right? Because that's part of what has led to our kids you know, yeah. suffering from all of this depression and whatnot is it's a lack of engagement. It was a lack of engagement with their peer groups, a lack of engagement with being able to, to do their normal activities, going to church, going to youth group, going to, you know, to, to athletic, um, into their athletic teams. And, um, and I think a lot of families were home together. I don't think we were engaging as we should have. I agree. I agree. Well, you know, I would recommend everybody be very proactive. Yeah. Pay attention to your kids. Get curious. Yeah. Find out what they're doing. They spend a lot of time in the alone in the room, shutting the door. You know, find out what they're doing. Let's get them engaged. Get yeah. them involved in activities. Um, sports. Yeah. Are are powerful. Our our three boys like to do jujitsu. I don't know if they like it, but they do jujitsu. Um, Depends on the day. They love it most of the time. They like to play basketball. Uh, if you notice signs of mental distress or anxiety in your child, it is important to take action. One of the first things you can do is to remain calm and empathetic. Don't try to reason with a situation that makes no sense. Instead, repeat back what your child is saying to show that you understand. You can say something like, I understand that you're feeling really overwhelmed right now and that's okay. Yeah. It, it, that's powerful when you really listen to your children and you yes. show them that you're listening to them without judgment. Yeah. Hey, I'm here for you. Yeah. I understand this is how you feel. This is what you say. Your feelings are yours. I'm going to validate that. Right. And let's work together. It says it's, it's also important to avoid all forms of conflict, whether it's verbal or physical. If you find yourself getting angry or frustrated, take a moment to step away and gather your thoughts. Try to approach the situation with an open mind and listen to your child's concern without judgment. Seeking professional help can also be incredibly beneficial. Talking to a mental health professional or counselor can help your child learn coping mechanisms and strategies to manage their anxiety and distress. Even talking to someone you trust, like a friend or family member, can be a great way to start the healing process. Yeah, so, but talking is key. You there, know, There you have it. Very much. Keep talking to those kids. Talk to your kids. Clean their air. Clean their water. Can they have hydrogen tablets, children? We will have to look that up. Yeah. Well, uh, double check on that. See if there's a warning about age and children. I, I doubt it, but let's make sure you're you're careful. So I think we did a good job today. We talked about some valid, uh, important current events. Uh, yep. Some good information there. What do you want our audience to do? I would like you to share this out, invite some uh, some friends to uh, to listen in. Yeah, um, you have topics um, that you want us to to go over, or articles that you found. Um, shoot us a message. Yeah, comment. Yeah, let us know. So we would Absolutely. love to subscribe. Hit the notify button so that when the next episode comes up, uh, you can hear it. And if we do one more, we have beat 90% of podcasts out there. It'll be our episode four. So that's exciting. Um, great job. Good show. And uh, please tune in next time. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.